to me. Happy birthday to me. Happy Dad. birthday. Please dear stop. Happy Please birthday stop. To Where are we? Welcome back to Between Light and Shadow, the podcast devoted to blowing out the Twilight Zone's birthday candles and then licking the frosting off of them. Not that it's the Twilight Zone's birthday, but come on, cake is good any day of the year, right? And before you get excited, yes, that clip is from It's a Good Life, but we aren't covering that episode this week. Sorry for the tease. But I needed a Zone-specific birthday song because, yep, that's right, gang, it's my birthday. And since it's my birthday, I'm giving myself the gift of two of my all-time favorite episodes, which, conveniently enough for our purposes here, share a common theme. Dreams. Or, to be more precise, nightmares. (laughs) Ooh, scary. Now, it just so happens that I share a birthday with the first episode we're covering this week, which turns 57 today, November 27th, 2016. I sprang forth exactly 10 years to the day after it first premiered. So if you math that out, you can figure out my true age. 67? Come on, seriously? You aren't 67? No! Go... Find yourself a damn math tutor, why don't you? Now, before I indulge in too much birthday cheer, let's get right into it. Shut the door, you wee little gutter snipe! Perchance to Dream was the 10th Twilight Zone episode to air, and the first to air that wasn't written by Rod Serling. This one comes from the typewriter of Charles Beaumont, who would ultimately write 22 episodes. Well, not exactly. He was credited with writing 22. His career stats are forever marred by an unfortunate asterisk as a few of those episodes were actually co-written or ghost-written entirely by others. Beaumont's health was rapidly declining during the Twilight Zone's fourth and fifth seasons, so it was necessary for him to hit his friends up for some help to finish his assignments. His was a tragically short life. But I'm not going to go into that this week. It's my birthday, damn it! I don't want to cry! We haven't really talked about this yet on the podcast, so this is a great spot to point out that Serling was the conscience of the Twilight Zone. He often explored controversial social and political themes couched in science fiction and fantasy terms so the censors wouldn't notice. There was almost always a moral to be found with Serling, or a pointed observation about humanity's failings or the dangers of technology or a condemnation of bigotry and war. By contrast, the other prominent writers on the show, chiefly Beaumont and Richard Matheson, had already established themselves as masters of the short story form. Their stock and trade was a good tale well told. They weren't trying to change your party affiliation or shame you into treating your neighbors better. They just wanted to entertain you, to surprise you. And yes, to scare you. So when they joined Serling to form the elite Twilight Zone writer's stable, their teleplays continued in that same vein. 
Now, while Matheson frequently leaned toward horror, Beaumont was more about twists in reality, mild surrealism, and the confounding mysteries of the human mind. Which brings us to Perchance to Dream. The episode was directed by Robert Flory, who would also direct The Fever later in Season 1, then come back a few years later for The Long Morrow in Season 5. Now, at some point during that gap, he directed the Outer Limits episode Moonstone, which is visually stunning, but pretty goddamn goofy otherwise. I'm sure he did other stuff in there too, but hey, check this out. I talked a few weeks ago about my love of the classic Universal Monsters, so it delights me to no end to offer up this little nugget of trivia. Robert Flory was assigned to direct the original Frankenstein in 1931, when the film was early in pre-production, when the role of the monster had been given to Bela Lugosi after his success as Dracula. Now, apparently the early screen tests with Lugosi were so bad that both he and director Flory were removed from the project. James Whale and Boris Karloff were brought in, and the rest was history. Now, the talents of Flory and Lugosi were shifted over to Murders in the Rue Morgue, which is a pretty good film in its own right, but it's not quite Frankenstein, is it? Now, speaking of Boris Karloff, Flory also directed an episode of Karloff's TV show, Thriller, in 1962. He also did five episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Oh, and one more thing. Flory also directed The Beast with Five Fingers for Warner Brothers in 1946. Now, the point of my spontaneous IMDb-gasm? Flory clearly had experience with both mystery and horror, which served him well here. We meet Edward Hall, standing outside an office building on a crowded city street. He's clearly distraught, fatigued, even disoriented. Basically me on any given Monday. Now he's there to see the good Dr. Elliot Rathman. The receptionist greets him. We've been expecting you, Mr. Hall. It seems unimportant. Why is he playing that clip, you ask? All in good time, kids. So Edward is a straight up mess. He's been awake for 87 hours because he's afraid to go to sleep. He has a heart condition, so his doctor has advised him to avoid excitement or shock. However, it doesn't matter how safe he plays it when he's awake, because at night, he's plagued by nightmares. But not just any nightmares. It seems Edward has an exceptionally vivid imagination and dreams in chapters. His current dream saga involves a girly show at a carnival. Hmm. Hurry, 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 friends. The show is about to begin. See a dance, see a wiggle. The most sensational and electrifying exhibition since Little Egypt. Now, friends, you're not going to be able to see anything standing out there. You've got to get down close. That's the idea right over here, right down close. I see it, friends. I'm not too close. Let's not trample each other. Now, friends, you say you want fat ones? We got them. You say you want thin ones? We've got them. Blondes, brunettes, redheads, and believe me, folks, if they ain't up here, they ain't worth looking at. And now, to give you a little demonstration of what you're going to see on the inside, Maya, the cat girl. Come on, baby. We know you're modest, but why should the folks out there take my word for it? Wait, who's this now? Maya, the cat girl, you say? Hmm... Yeah, okay, I'll, uh, I'll stick around for a minute. I don't want to be rude. Plus, it is my birthday, so a little cheesecake might be the only cake I get today. You know, I... Oh, oh, here she comes. Holy Toledo! Wow. I feel kind of... The way her body is gyrating and undulating, and those sultry eyes, oh boy, she's she's the kind of girl you bring home to mother, 
when mother's not home. Damn, son. Oh my god. Those hips don't lie. What's going on in there? <clears throat> Nothing. Nothing, honey bunny. Do I need to check your browser history again? No, sweetie. I'm just, uh, I'm looking at some cat videos online. So funny. Iken has cheeseburger. <laughs> And that grumpy cat with the eyebrows? <laughs> Hilarious. Uh-huh. You know, that's actually sort of accurate, right? Because Maya's a cat girl and stuff. <clears throat> Moving on. So since it's a dream, the impossibly hot girl comes on to him like gangbusters. I tells you gangbusters. And she's a firecracker, this one. She's on the hunt for thrills, excitement, all the things that Edward should be avoiding because of his heart condition. She drags him into a haunted house attraction, which gets his weak ticker a racin', then uses her feminine wiles to coax him up onto a roller coaster. And while they're at the top, she encourages him to take a flying leap. Literally. That's where the dream ended four nights ago, and he hasn't slept since. If I go to sleep, I'll go right back to the roller coaster. Maya will reach me. She'll push me. And that'll be the end of me. On the other hand, if I stay awake any longer, the strain will be too much for my heart, and that'll be the end of me. Head you win, tails I lose. It's quite a choice, huh, Doctor? Edward decides that the good shrink can't help him and leaves the office where the receptionist, Miss Thomas, is busily typing... Uh, whatever psychiatrists, receptionists type, I guess. And it's here that we see her face. Maya! Edward runs back into Dr. Rathman's office, then promptly dives through the window to his death. We then cut to Dr. Rathman, sitting at his desk, looking thoughtfully at Edward, lying there on the couch. Wait, not yet. Dr. Rathman then calls Miss Thomas in as a witness while he checks for a pulse. Nope, Ed's dead, baby. Probably from a heart attack. Rathman delivers the final line. Or is it the punchline? Well, I guess there are worse ways to go. At least he died peacefully. Okay, now, hit it! But would you look at that? It was all a dream! He didn't really jump out that window. Maya the cat girl wasn't really trying to kill him. Hell, Maya the cat girl didn't even really exist. And that might piss you off a bit, right? I mean, it was all a dream seems like a total cheat particularly coming from the Twilight Zone. So what's the point? Serling closes out with a comment about dreams only lasting a few seconds, so maybe this whole thing was nothing more than a commentary on the elasticity of perception within dreams. It's an interesting concept that feels Twilight Zone appropriate, so why not? But you know what? That's not what the episode is about at all. Serling's outro is kind of a last-minute misdirect. You have to ignore it and think back over the episode to get what it was really about. You've got to go back in and retrace your steps. And if you don't, you miss quite a bit. I've mentioned previously that some Twilight Zones exhibit film noir characteristics, but Perchance to Dream is the first episode that I would categorize as an actual film noir. It has the classic noir structure. Guy tells the story, in flashback, sort of, of a ruinous femme fatale who has driven him to the end of his rope, but it goes a step beyond those trappings and puts us at the mercy of an unreliable narrator. Keep in mind that everything we think we know about Edward, his heart condition, his insomnia, his recurring dreams of Maya, and his ultimate suicide are all elements of a dream. All we really know about him is that he's really tired. <laughs> 
he falls asleep in Dr. Rathman's office and promptly dies of a heart attack. That's it. Everything else is part of his dream. So there's no reason to think that any of it is actually true. Who is Edward Hall, really? Why is he so tired? We don't even know if Dr. Rathman is a psychiatrist. His title is a generic MD. He might be Edward's family doctor, for all we know. Maybe Edward is there because he suffers from a simple case of insomnia. We don't know. And there's no moral to be found here, no soapbox, no indictment of societal ills. But Serling didn't write it. And again, Beaumont didn't grind many axes in his stories, at least not in the ones that he adapted for The Twilight Zone. The episode doesn't contain any actual supernatural elements or science fiction trappings, but that doesn't make it any less a Twilight Zone, because The Twilight Zone is a dimension of mind, after all. A circle in a spiral, a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, on an ever spinning reel, as the images unwind, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Now, if you take it as a straight narrative, the Bobby Ewing in the shower slash it was all a dream resolution is kind of disappointing, but I do think it's a mistake to dismiss it on that basis. The more you dig into it, the more layers it reveals. Beaumont gives us the dramatic equivalent of a set of Russian nesting dolls. Edward is dreaming himself telling Dr. Rathman about his dream self's dreams. It's an ingenious construct that serves as a compelling meditation on the mysteries of the human dream state. So sure, that perception elasticity thing is a part of that, but it's not the whole ball of wax by any means. Now, Christopher Nolan would explore a similar concept in 2010's Inception, which is one of the best, not a Twilight Zone, but pretty damn close films in recent memory. Now, I couldn't find anything indicating that Nolan was inspired by this episode, but I like to think that he was. In fact, I couldn't really find anything connecting him to the Twilight Zone at all, except the rumors from a few years back that he was maybe going to direct uh, a new Twilight Zone movie, which apparently isn't happening now, because instead somebody's doing some kind of bullshit, choose-your-own-adventure, interactive series thing instead. It's too bad. If you examine his films, you see a lot of Twilight Zone-ish themes in there. And I've heard people draw comparisons between Perchance to Dream and The Nightmare on Elm Street films, but I don't know. I think 1984's Dreamscape is probably a closer relative. And Inception definitely owes a bit of a debt to Dreamscape. Let's see, what else? Oh, in watching this episode again recently for the podcast... I found myself chuckling several times over that really large and easily accessible window in Dr. Rathman's office. Quite a drop. Uh, Mr. Hall, I'll, uh, I'll have to close the window. I only wanted some air. Well, I'll uh, turn a conditioner up. It works best with the windows closed. Did you think I'd jump? Well, you might have. Was this standard for psychiatrists' office back then? I mean, I'm guessing not, but it's interesting to note that death by window jump is a pretty common way to go in film noir, so it makes sense that we'd see it here. Now, of course, Edward doesn't really jump out that window, but he dreams himself doing it, so he'd probably seen some of those film noirs at his local theater. When I was a kid, I used to dream in sequence. Remember the... Adventure serials you used to have in the movie theaters? It was like that. Every dream was a chapter. I'd always remember because when I woke up, I'd write down what happened. It's crazy, huh? Playing Edward is actor Richard Conti, and he is perfect in the role. Uh, he has this cadence to his voice. It's like a fevered, urgent Morse code as he tells his story. Now, Conti did appear in a few actual film noirs, 
including the big combo from 1955, where he played a crime boss. I'm in the only trouble with you is you'd like to be me. You'd like to have my organization, my influence, my fix. You can't. It's impossible. You think it's money. It's not. It's personality. You haven't got a lieutenant. You're a cop. Slow, steady, intelligent, with a bad temper and a gun under your arm. And with a big yen for a girl you can't have. First is first and second is nobody. Now, the big combo isn't necessarily top shelf noir, but it is kind of historic because I think it's the first time in American cinema that we see a guy go down on a girl. No, I'm serious. Okay, it's not explicitly shown, but it's pretty heavily implied. Go check it out for yourself. It's right around the 29 minute 45 second mark. Now, at least I'm not aware of an earlier American film that went there, other than porn, of course. Any uh, cunning linguists out there who know differently, let me know. Mr. Hall, now you really think running away will do you any good? Well, don't get me wrong. Sometimes running away is the best answer. But I don't know that yours is that sort of problem. Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. Well, you do what you like. And playing Dr. Rathman is John Larch. Uh, he's also good. Um, the psychiatrist's role in films and TV is usually kind of a blank slate, just a springboard for whatever crazy shit the patient character busts out. But there's a bit more going on here. He seems a bit more sympathetic, more human than uh, this type of character usually is, which again might be because he's a family doctor and not an actual psychiatrist. That's my theory, anyway. John Larch is probably better remembered in Zone Circles as Anthony Fremont's dad in It's a Good Life, which, again, we're not covering this week. Edward! Get away from me. There's nothing to be afraid of, Edward. It's only a dream. I've got a heart condition. I can't stand all this excitement. It's silly. There isn't any excitement. You said so yourself. You're at home, asleep in bed. Now you can do all the things you can't do when you're awake. And rounding out the cast is the irrepressible Suzanne Lloyd as Maya the Cat Girl. <sighs> She's, uh, well, you know. I never forget a pussy. Cat. You got me straight tripping, boo. <laughs> Funny story about Suzanne Lloyd, uh, she used to sell signed 8x10s from her website, which isn't there anymore, by the way, so I ordered a couple. I asked her to inscribe one of them to Craig Meow. I thought it might be cute, or sexy, you know, like Meow, you know, like Julie Newmar Catwoman style. You feel me, right? Anyway, her written response which accompanied my 8x10s, read as follows. Maya is not a meow character. I patterned her after a panther, but I will write what you requested. And she did, but under protest. Yeah, that's right, I pissed off Maya the cat girl. My one actual interaction with this goddess of Twilight Zondom and I offended her feline sensibilities. But my Maya woes didn't end there. Back in the early days of Biff Bang Pow's Twilight Zone collectibles line, say, sometime between 2010 to 2013, I was in fairly regular contact with them, pitching ideas and begging for certain characters to get the action figure treatment. We had a good relationship. They even gave me a few scoops for my blog, so I got to announce upcoming stuff before anybody else. The action figure that I wanted them to produce most was Maya the Cat Girl, and they eventually relented. They put together a Maya 8-inch action figure prototype and even had it available for pre-order. And then... disaster struck. See, they'd been operating on the understanding that while they couldn't use actor likenesses, they were okay to use character likenesses. Now, apparently CBS saw it differently and basically restricted them to only doing aliens or monsters or characters without a recognizable human face. 
several planned figures got the axe. Anthony Fremont from It's a Good Life, which again, we're not covering this week. Art Carney as Santa Claus from Night of the Meek. Marsha the Mannequin from The After Hours. Battling Maxo from Steel. And yes, Maya the Cat Girl from Perchance to Dream, which I had championed all canceled. Now, a few human characters have since surfaced in their three and three quarter inch line, like Anthony Fremont and Santa Claus. Not sure how they pulled those off, but sad to say, Maya is still MIA. One more Maya tidbit. I posted a Maya specific entry in my blog back in 2010. All these years later, it remains the single most viewed page in the entire blog. So clearly, I'm not her only fan. Charles Beaumont adapted Perchance to Dream from his short story of the same name, which was published in Playboy magazine in 1958. He'd go on to adapt several of his stories for the series, but this was the very first. Many of the show's adaptations of pre-existing stories were done by Rod Serling, especially in the first season, but in this case, Beaumont was allowed to adapt it himself, which is pretty impressive. It was his first time. Now, Richard Matheson wasn't quite so lucky. His first Twilight Zone was a Serling adaptation of one of his stories that bears little to no resemblance to its original. But that's a story for a different podcast episode. Soon, kids. Soon. Anyway, Perchance to Dream, the story is very similar to the final episode, except the protagonist is named Philip Hall instead of Edward Hall. And Maya isn't an exotic dancer, she's just a pretty girl in a white dress. Oh, and Edward doesn't intentionally jump through the window. He sees Miss Thomas, freaks out, turns to run, trips, and just sort of breaks on through to the other side. Perchance to Dream contains an original music score by Nathan Van Cleve, which is notable because it's the first use of the theremin on the Twilight Zone. It... Oh, um, um, I'm getting a call. I should pick it up. I'm sorry, I, I know. I'm like that asshole on the first date who won't stop looking at his phone. Hello? Dude, it's Doc. Hey, Doc. What's up? Dude, 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 dude. Did you not read my book? I did read your book, but it was like over a feverish weekend and I plowed through it and I don't remember a lot of it. What did I do? No theremin, buddy. No theremin. No theremin? No theremin. Van Cleve did not use a theremin. Really? Well, he it... did, however, manipulate both the violin and the Hammond organ to Just sound like a theremin. Sound like a theremin. Okay, now that's interesting. Do you think that he didn't have access to one at the time, so he did this workaround thing, or was it just like an experimental thing where he's like, oh, let's see if I can get this to sound like that? It could have actually been either of those things. Um, I don't know if you know how the theremin works, uh, but it's an instrument that you actually play without touching it. Right. Which is kind of weird. Uh, but uh, clearly it's really difficult to get anybody to play a theremin really well. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time within Hollywood, there were only a couple of people who were studio musicians who were thereminists and who did oh, it really wow. well. Okay. Um, so maybe it may have been more than the show's budget. Oh. Um, when it was used in shows like The Outer Limits, it was actually library cues from One Step Beyond. Mm -hmm. um, so they were already existing, and so it's probably that's why the theremin played so much within um, The Outer Limits. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, no teasy episode at all uses a theremin. Ever. Ever. Wow, okay, interesting. Um, well, as long as you're on the phone, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Perchance to Dream score. Um, yeah. So it's... Uh, a Van Cleave, it's his first contribution to the show. Yep. Um, and maybe you can shed some light on this. Um, and I actually, here's where I prove that I did read your book because I remember <laughs> they remember you mentioning that he actually composed one score for the episode, and then he turned around and scored another or wrote another score for the episode. Yeah. 
so maybe maybe explain that to me like why why are there two uh we don't know i wish i actually had an answer for that um but uh the funny thing is that oftentimes with twilight zone episodes people were like for some reason unhappy about the way a score sounded Mm. Um, and that happened also with I Sing the Body Electric. Oh, okay. Uh, there, there were multiple scores for that, too. And that's that's also Van Cleave, right? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, there were, there were moments. There was a couple of, of instances also with Bernard Herrmann scores where they were just not happy. Um, but those scores, we don't have the other alternate stuff um everything that we do have comes from like martin graham's book and stuff like that that talks about how um there were these correspondences that Mm -hmm. people didn't like things and they should have alternate cues uh composed but you know what's really cool what i don't know if you actually ever noticed this i kind of shockingly never noticed this until relatively recently is that if you listen to the score for perchance to dream Mm -hmm. Some of the cues are used almost exactly uh, in um, two. And they they are renamed, uh, and that has to do with the performing rights stuff from the day. So, like, there were these stipulations that you could not use certain uh, TV scores within other seasons. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in order for him to legally do the stuff, uh, we use the stuff from Perchance to Dream in two, he had to retitle it and make maybe a couple of tweaks. Uh, but other than that, there's like, for instance, um, the cue sleep, uh, which also gets recomposed in the cues. What's funny, the crash untitled and finale are also the same cues in the two episode, the jungle go away and two are one. So he's basically using, he's reusing cues. He's recording them again. Right. Within the context of a new score, but he's just retitling the cues. Right. And that happens a lot in Outer Limits, too. Oh, wow. Okay. That is... uh, and also, there's a, a lot of the score is very reminiscent, or should I say, the score of The Midnight Sun is very reminiscent in, um, from the music in Pretense to Dream. Oh. He loves that reverb on the organ. <laughs> loves yeah. to repeat those notes and add reverb to them until they're like really weird. <laughs> I love Van Cleave music. In fact, out of yeah. all of the composers who worked in the Twilight Zone, Van Cleave is by far my favorite. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. Well, I um I am also a big fan. Um, I I mean I'm a diehard Herman advocate though, so I mean I I don't think I can really say out loud that I prefer Van Cleave. <laughs> um, but having listen to twilight zone music continuously for years and years and years um or maybe at least regularly not continuously i listen to herman all the time and i think in more recent years i have found that i have been listening more to the other composers um van cleave definitely is at the top of that list um he did i think seven or eight total scores i feel like i should know that off the top like i should know that (laughs) Okay, you wrote a book about this, so you probably should know that off the top of your head. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, Ooh. ten, eleven, twelve. Oh. Okay. Oh, my God. So we have Perchance to Dream, Midnight Sun, two, Jess Bell, Black Leather Jackets, A Kind of Stopwatch, A World of Difference, What You Need, Elegy, I Sing the Body Electric, Steel, and From Agnes the Glow. Okay, I got eleven there. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. He wrote the most of, of anyone. All Fred right. Was in the close second. Which, by the way, funny enough, um, Fred Steiner actually did some ghost writing and ghost orchestrating for Van Cleave in the Twilight Zone. We just don't know exactly what. Oh, interesting. Oh. Um, now, Van Cleave is not, you know, like, as far as film composers go, film and television composers, not exactly a household name. Um, you know, we all know Jerry Goldsmith. We all know Bernard Herrmann. Um, we all know Franz Waxman. Um, even, I, even Fred Steiner, I think one would be more likely to have heard of, of him, but Van Cleve didn't do a whole lot. Um, I know he did a few films. Um, he did the Twilight Zone. 
I don't even know if he did any other TV stuff. I don't think so. I know. I think he did some radio stuff too. Mm. Okay, so perchance to dream. It's got that neat carnival little thing going on, um, which is fun. And if you notice, the very beginning of when um, it all, Hall has that flashback into his first dream, when he finds himself into that carno, in that carnival, huh? um, before he even meets Maya, you hear like a very grotesque waltz. Right. Um, that trope is really present in a lot of science fiction TV. Um, you'll find it again in Herman's score for Living Doll. Um, oh. You'll find it in um, Dominic Frontieri's score for the forms of things unknown at the moment in which the ballerina figure is sort of spinning around. <laughs> that also, what a lot of people don't know about that score, which you probably do, but a lot of people don't, is that um, it was they wrote a show um, called The Unknown that was supposed to be a TV pilot when they thought The Outer Limits was being canceled. Right. Uh, and so the score and the entire script, with the exception of the science fiction elements that are in the forms of Things Unknown, um, were actually put into The Outer Limits version. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, See, now I can't go without talking about The Outer Limits. And you shouldn't. <laughs> and I mean, I, I don't know if I frequently do, but I oftentimes go over there that's my other favorite show so i mean i i welcome those little outer limits side tangents um, i feel like i i have Teresa in my ear <laughs> <laughs> now she's yelling at me <laughs> right. so that this whole idea of electronically manipulating acoustic instruments was that a pretty new thing at this point in time um relatively it was done in some stuff but it was mainly done in films okay uh, because the films had much larger budgets. Oh, um, that's right. So I go on an Outer Limits tangent again, but um, a lot of the instruments that are electronic in the Outer Limits are actually instruments that are um, not instruments at all, mm-hmm. uh, such as the vacuum cleaner that was hooked up to an isolator. <laughs> so, I mean, part of it had to do with the fact that getting a hold of electronic instruments was generally expensive. Um, and even for The Outer Limits, uh, John Ellis Held had said that one of the reasons why they had to do what they did with making things that were not instruments into instruments is because there were only very few places that you can get some of these electronic instruments within Hollywood. Mm. And when you could get them, number one, they may not have been easily playable by anybody. Um, or you had to find somebody who could play it, and then, of course, it would cost a lot of money. Mm. So I'm going to assume that given the overlap in, in time between The Outer Limits and The Twilight Zone, that the same would have applied to The Twilight Zone even as early as the first season in 1959. Okay. So we know that there was two, there were two written scores. Do right. you know if his first score was recorded either completely or in part before uh, he or whoever decided that it needed to be redone? Um, I don't... Um... And part of this has to do with the fact that every score had a very specific number. Um, And so, for instance, um, sometimes the number on the score um, would not transfer over to the recording for whatever reason. Uh, Or sometimes they would just refer to it by a second number. So, for instance, um, what we have are um, some scores for Perchance to Dream. and some cues that have different numbers. We have one that's uh, CPN 5831, one's CPN 5837. Um, but we don't have a recording of cues under both of those numbers. It's I think it's, everything's under 37. Yeah. So there could have been stuff for 31 in there, but we would never know because they were yeah. under 37. At some point in time, I managed to get a hold of, of cue sheets for the entire series. Um, and I'm looking at the one for Perchance to Dream. And I actually have two, um, because one just says Perchance to Dream Suite. And right. then the other page actually breaks it down with all the different cues. Um, but interestingly, on this the original actual cue sheet, it lists... You know, the Twilight Zone main title by Herman. Then it lists the Perchance to Dream Suite. Then it lists a cue called The Station by Bernard Herman. 
that lasts for five seconds, then it goes to the end theme. I have not been able to find anything else that would indicate that that there's a Herman cue at the very end of that. No. And it's weird. I don't know if it's like a mistake or something. Oh, there were tons of mistakes on this cue sheet. Oh, great. <laughs> Over the place. Part of them, uh, part of these mistakes were deliberate uh, because, of course, you had to. Well, th- it was very complicated because you could. Um, th- there were clauses in contracts saying that you, once you have your music approved. Uh, they could basically record them in any which way they want with different alternate endings and speeds and whatever uh, to reuse however they see fit in the library with you know, royalties. Right. Um, so some of it had to do with the fact that um, if there were pieces of, uh, if there were cues that were reused in other seasons, which was technically a no-no, uh, they would substitute it on the cue sheet for something else to make it look like they didn't use oh. that. <laughs> um, yeah. And sometimes they were just sheer mistakes. Like they said that there was a cue in, in there somewhere that wasn't at all, or something that they forgot they, you know, they forgot to list a cue somewhere. That's interesting. Um, and it's probably a thing too, where back then it's like, they could do that. They could just put the wrong cues in there to kind of, you know, mask that they were reusing things they shouldn't have been. Nobody's probably going to notice that. Oh, yeah. And actually, Fred Steiner, um, his papers are at Brigham Young University for the most part. Mm-hmm. And um, I, when I was doing research on my book, I was able to get copies of the stuff that they had from his papers. And one of the things that they had was he actually had tried suing Image Entertainment before he died uh, because oh. he wasn't getting royalties on the video cassettes that featured his music for The Twilight Zone. Mm-hmm. But because of that original clause in the contract, the lawyers said you can't sue them. Right. But I actually have that letter saying all of that. Oh, wow. Yeah, so even once you know everything started to be released, some composers decided they were going to try and see if they can get royalties, even though, unfortunately, the original contract stood. Which is basically, you compose this for our show, we own it, we can mutate it any way we see fit, and Pretty much. It's, it's all ours. Right? Yep. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Dr. Reba Wisner is the author of A Dimension of Sound, Music in the Twilight Zone, and more recently, We Will Control All That You Hear, The Outer Limits, and The Aural Imagination. Here I had to take a breath before I said that. That is a long time. My titles are getting longer. That's true. (laughs) Uh, Well, Doc, thanks again uh, for calling to set me straight on that theremin faux pas. I appreciate that. (laughs) what I'm here for. (laughs) All right. I'll talk to you soon. All righty. Take care. Bye. Fast forward to May 5th, 1961. The Twilight Zone is nearing the end of its second season. It's been a bit of an uneven season with some really great episodes. I have The Beholder, Nervous Man in a $4 Room, mixed with some really shitty ones. A Most Unusual Camera, The Whole Truth. Uh, Happily, the old girl still had a couple of gems in her pocket before she wrapped for the summer. One of them was called Shadow Play. And it went a little something like this. We fade in on a dark courtroom. The defendant, Adam Grant, sits in contemplative silence. The lights come on, and the jury enters to deliver the verdict. He is guilty of first-degree murder. The judge sentences him to the electric chair, at which point Grant emphatically claims that everything, this entire world, this entire reality, is merely a dream that he's having. And if they execute him, they'll kill themselves too, since he'll wake up when they fry him and the dream will end. But no matter, he's to be executed at midnight. Now Richie, the district attorney, is satisfied with the conviction and doesn't believe Grant's story. Carson the city editor, shows up at his house drunk and tries to plead Grant's case before midnight strikes. Richie's wife goes to bed early and tells him the steaks that she's cooking in the oven will be done in five minutes. Richie finally relents and goes to see Grant. Grant sticks to his story, and Richie sticks to his refusal to buy into it. 
Grant then busts out the equivalent of a rabbit in a magician's hat. I'm telling the truth, Mr. Ritchie! Please! Let me live and I'll, I'll keep you alive. I'll dream you every night just like this. Wait a minute! I'll prove it to you. Your wife, she has a steak cooking for you. Go home, look in the oven. It'll be something else. Please! Wait, how could Grant possibly know about the steaks? Richie races home to check and finds a roast has replaced the steaks. Wait, what? Whoa, game changer alert. It appears that Grant can change elements in his dream at will. This opens up a ton of story possibilities. Let's put a pin in that for now. So Richie is starting to waver. But damn it, he has a duty to see the execution through. Back in his cell, Grant makes some telling observations that lend credence to his claims. Jiggs, don't you think it, that all of this is just, just a little bit too much the way it should be? I don't get you. Well, I mean it's so pat. I got tried and sentenced the same day. It doesn't work like that. But you see, that's the way that I saw it in my mind. And so that's the way it is. Or you, you, you take this place here, you and Cooley and, and his harmonica, or, or Phillips and his mother. <laughs> it's like a movie. Real death houses aren't like that. But you see, I've never been in a real death house. So that's... That's my impression of it. Midnight looms. Carson finally sways Richie by pointing out that if Grant really believes this is all a dream, then a case could be made that he's mentally incompetent. Richie calls the governor's office to ask for a stay of execution just as the clock strikes 12. In the death house, the switch is thrown, Grant seizes up in the electric chair, and everything goes black. The lights come up in the courtroom. Grant sits in silence, waiting for the verdict. His attorney is there with him, but it's not the same attorney as it was before. The jury enters and again pronounces him guilty. The judge, a different judge this time, sentences him to death. And the dream repeats itself yet again. Shadow Play was directed by John Brom, who holds the record for directing more episodes than anyone else. 12 total. And like Perchance to Dream, this one is written by Charles Beaumont, but unlike Perchance to Dream, Beaumont didn't adapt it from an existing short story. This one's an original teleplay, which, yeah, kind of makes sense. You really need the visual impact of seeing characters suddenly replaced by different people when the dream starts over. How do you convey that in a written narrative? Now, I likened Perchance to Dream to a set of Russian nesting dolls. Shadow play, meanwhile, is like a toy top, perpetually spinning, its appearance shifting with every wobble in its revolutions. Or, hey, the holidays are upon us, so maybe a dreidel would be more appropriate. I have a little dreidel, I made it out of clay, and when it's dry and ready, with dreidel I shall play. Oh, dreidel, 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 I made you out of clay. Dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. <laughs> Now, dreams are, of course, very present in films and television. Pleasant daydreams, startling nightmares, but we almost always see the dreamer waking up from them. I mean, it's a very common dramatic device. What's so distinctive about shadow play is that we only see the dream. We don't see Adam Grant go to sleep. We don't see him wake up. We just fade to black on one dream, then fade up on the next, which is presumably taking place the following night. This adds to the surreal quality of the episode. It's an unsettling suspension of the narrative standard that we're all used to. Well, haven't you ever been hurt in one of those dreams? Haven't you ever fallen out of a window or, or been drowned or tortured? You have. Well, don't you remember how real that it seemed? Remember how you woke up screaming? Well, let me ask you something, Mr. Richie. How do you like to wake up screaming every night? That's what I do. Because I dream the same dream night after night after night. It's this one. It changes a little bit. The people get twisted around, but it's the same dream. Now, like Richard Conti and Perchance to Dream, Dennis Weaver is just great as Adam Grant. He's suitably agitated where appropriate, but there's also this weariness about him that makes perfect sense, since he's been having the same dream for God knows how long. 
The scene in which he describes the long walk to the electric chair as effectively chilling, due partly to the disturbingly calm manner in which he describes it. He should be freaking out, but he's done this so many times that it's like reciting the alphabet. And that smash cut to the sizzling stakes after the line, they pull the switch, is a great jump moment. Now, about those stakes turning into a roast. Hmm. So if Grant can change things in his dream at will, why can't he just free himself? Again, the very idea opens up a ton of story possibilities, but he never does it again, and it's never even mentioned again. The only thing it provides is a shocking twist going into the commercial break. It doesn't really contribute anything, so what's the point? It's probably best that they ignore it going forward, since if he has that kind of control over his dreams, he could probably figure out a way to avoid being executed, and this would suddenly be a very different story, and most likely not a better one. Now, as long as I'm pointing out potential flaws, what's the deal with the disappearing clock and lamp in Richie's living room when midnight strikes? Is there some sort of significance to those objects, or is it just to convey that the dream reality is disintegrating? If it's the former, I don't get it. If it's the latter, they should have done way more with it. Remember the simple blur effect that they used when Barbie Jean Trenton disappeared in the 16mm Shrine? Even something that basic would have worked better, I think. But some, like, melting effect would have been really cool, too. Here's a question. When you dream, are you always there in the dream? I can't recall having a single dream in which some parts of it included me and other parts didn't. My dreams are always first person, and I guess I always kind of assume that's how everybody dreams. Edward Hall's dreams always include him as the central figure, yet large sections of Adam Grant's dreams play out without him even being present. I turn to my trusted ally, the internet, for some enlightenment. Here's what I found courtesy of the Dream Foundation. Your viewpoint or perspective in a dream can be insightful. First person, where you play yourself, shows that you have a fixed identity or character. This is particularly common in nightmares and anxiety dreams, where you are quite caught up in your role as dream actor. The other most common perspective is third person, where you witness the dream from an audience viewpoint as a disembodied watcher or point of awareness. Sometimes, though not always, this can point to feelings or situations which are not being felt or experienced, i.e. you are removed from the scene. A balanced blend of these two perspectives is a good step toward lucid dreaming. Okay, you know what? That's not fair. I want to have third-person dreams. I'm sick of dreaming about shit happening to me all the time. I want to watch shit happen to other people for a change. How do I make this happen? It's my birthday, goddammit! Wait, today's your birthday? Get out of here, you little... (laughs) Shadowplay doesn't have an original score, which means the music cues found within came from the CBS Music Library. Actually, my home slice Fred from the Twilight Pwn and I touched on this a bit last week. I also really like Shadowplay. You know the beginning when it's like that, like, dun... Yeah, done, done. That's a library score. Oh, really? It is? Oh, wow. It's very well done, though. See what I did there? I found a way to have Fred appear on the podcast again this week. I might just throw in random clips from that interview in every episode from now on, making him basically my involuntary co-host. Anyway, Shadowplay is mostly Nathan Van Cleve stuff composed for the season one episode Elegy, and some other more generic library stuff of his. But surprisingly, there's not a single cue from Perchance to Dream. Now, similarly themed episodes would often contain the same music cues, a sign of the forethought that went into the library music choices. But, well, not so much the case here. It's too bad. I think those lower-key, throbbing, slow-burn, perchance-to-dream cuts would have fit in marvelously in Shadowplay. See, 
here's here's the thing. Elegy isn't exactly a favorite episode of mine, and one of the reasons is the music score. I'm not going to go into it here, except to say that, for me, the music doesn't really fit with the episode. But the bits reused for Shadowplay actually make a lot more sense to me in that context. But I still vastly prefer the Perchance to Dream score, and I think it would have been an improvement, not that shadow play needs improving. Now here, see if you agree. We know you're mentally sound. I don't think you're deliberately lying to me. I'm going to destroy that story of yours, Grant, now once and for all. You say that all this is a dream, and that when you're electrocuted, you wake up. And when you wake up, we all disappear, right? That's right. What about our parents, and our parents' parents, and everybody who never even heard of you? Well, what about them, Mr. Ritchie? A, a dream builds its own world, Mr. Ritchie. It's complete with a past, and as long as you stay asleep, a future. Well, what about us, then, when we sleep and dream? Or is that when you're supposed to be up and around? You only sleep and dream because I dream you that way. All right. Now answer me this. You're scared now. Why? Why are you scared? You've got to wake up sometime, even if you're electrocuted, so why don't you just sit back and enjoy it? <laughs> enjoy it. Oh yeah, yeah, that works. The prologue of Shadowplay is remarkably similar to a scene in the 1940 film Stranger on the Third Floor, which is widely considered one of the first, if not the first, true film noirs. The film contains a great, very surreal dream sequence in which the protagonist is found guilty of murder and sentenced to death. He freaks out and has to be restrained by guards, just like Adam Grant. Now here's that one first. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? Yes! Yeah. But I'm not guilty! The stranger killed him! There! There he is! Why don't you do something? You get away! Arrest him! Michael Ward, face the court. It is the judgment of this court that you be taken to the state prison. And be there, put to death, in the manner prescribed by law. And may God have mercy on your soul. And here's the corresponding scene from Shadowplay. Adam Grant, you have been tried by a jury of your peers and found guilty. It is the sentence of this court that for the brutal and despicable crime of murder in the first degree... You shall be put to death by means of electrocution. <laughs> no! Not again! I won't die again! You can't make me die again! Oh, God, please, please, please! Tell him, Mr. District Attorney, that this isn't real! Make him understand they're only a dream I'm having! You fools! You kill me! You'll die! You believe me! Make him believe me! Tell the district attorney he's prosecuted himself and everybody in this building and everybody in the world! Tell him, Mr. Carson, before it's too late! Tell him! More recently, there's a dream sequence in Vanilla Sky in which Tom Cruise is running around in a totally abandoned Times Square and Shadowplay is playing on the Jumbotron. I practically jumped out of my seat with excitement when I first saw it back in 2001. My wife, who was then my fiancé, thought I was crazy. I still do. Well, wouldn't I have to be... I bet you anything they didn't even make me a goddamn cake.
1986, CBS launched an updated Twilight Zone TV series, the format of which more closely resembled Rod Serling's later series Night Gallery. Each episode ran an hour and included multiple stories of varying lengths. They were mostly new stories with an occasional remake of an original series episode. One of those was Shadowplay. No, I'm not going to this again. I don't have to listen to you. Do you know why? Because you're not real. None of this is real. I can assure you, Mr. Grant, this is very real. This is a dream. All of this and all of you are a dream from inside here. Remove the defendant from the court. You fool. Don't you understand that I invented you? And that without me you'd cease to exist? Don't you understand? You would cease to exist! That's actor Peter Coyote playing Adam Grant. It's the same basic story with a couple of deviations. There's a whole subplot with Adam Grant's sister, which has no real bearing on anything, and he doesn't die in the electric chair. Hanging is the method of choice here. They actually slip in a cute nostalgia bit by having him vanish as soon as he drops. We see the shadow of the empty noose swinging, just like we saw in the original series episode, Execution. Overall, like all the new show's attempts to recapture the glory by directly remaking episodes, the new shadow play is a big step down. Peter Coyote is no Dennis Weaver, sad to say, and the whole thing just sort of lays there. There's no real urgency. I was going to talk a bit about Groundhog Day, but that's really about an actual time glitch where one man relives the same day over and over, which isn't the same as a recurring dream. Now, there's also an X-Files episode called Monday with a similar premise. Now, interestingly, when asked if it was inspired by Groundhog Day, writer Vince Gilligan, who cites The Twilight Zone as his favorite TV show of all time, said it was actually inspired by Shadowplay. So, there you go. Perchance to Dream and Shadow Play are two great tastes that taste great together. Mmm, the Reese's Peanut Butter Cup, or maybe the alcoholic equivalent, really hit the spot right about now. Now, our gimmick here on the podcast is to compare two episodes with similar themes, and this particular combo is probably the purest example we've covered so far. Two explorations of the strange and incomprehensible world of dreams unified by the singular vision of their author, Charles Beaumont. Perchance to Dream lays out the horrific potential inherent in the dream state, and Shadowplay loops that horror unto infinity. Back in the early days of home video, i.e. pre-DVD, CBS Fox released Perchance to Dream and Shadowplay together on one VHS volume. They knew what was up. This pair is absolute Twilight Zone perfection. I love both episodes, so I hate to choose. But for me, shadow play is superior. A fatal bad dream is one thing. At least it ends, right? There's relief to be found, even if it's death. But if you're reliving the same horror night after night after night, that's something altogether more horrific and disturbing. Perchance to dream ends on a downbeat note, sure, but it still wraps up nice and neat. Shadowplay just hangs there in front of you, spinning forever. And it still haunts me, more than 30 years after I first saw it. It's the Twilight Zone at its absolute best. Agree? Disagree? Don't care either way, but you still want to talk to us? You can find us on Facebook and Tumblr. Just search for at ZonePod, one word, Z-O-N-E-P-O-D. Or you can take it a step further and email us directly at zonepod at gmail.com. Or hey, since it's my birthday and stuff, you could mosey on over to iTunes and leave us a rating or a review. I know it's time out of your busy schedule, and I do respect that. But come on, please... I'll save you a piece of cake, if I even get one, that is. Thanks for listening, kids. Until next week, play nice.
between light and shadow.